Hello, I am Angelus de Mortiel. The Mortiel fallacy from its inception has been a means of educating consumers in a world drowning in marketing misinformation and propaganda. This is going to be a bit different from my previous TMF videos because I wanted to make a concise argument to tackle one particular source of misinformation. I want it to be clear that I hold no particular fondness or allegiance to any particular company in this. My side is the side of the consumer. Nothing more, nothing less. I also would appreciate it if you could share this out. I'm not doing this for popularity. I don't make money off of this. I just want to get the information out there. With that said, let's break down some of Tim Sweeney's more pervasive claims about Valve. As a disclaimer, all the following information is conjecture. Valve is a private company and, as such, is under no obligations to release any of their financial information. The conjecture below is based upon research that's publicly available and relevant tech industry information. Citations and relevant links will be in the description down below. Let's discuss now the claims being made by Tim Sweeney as he attempts to justify the reasons for actions taken by Epic Games as a means to gain a foothold in the PC marketplace. Most notably, I'm going to focus on three particular areas of misinformation. These areas will be concise and I'll try to be as to the point as possible so that you can have a good means of understanding of what's going on. 1. Valve's 70-30 revenue split is excessively high and they could survive and be profitable with an 88-12 revenue split instead. 2. Exclusivity is competition and Epic needs to do this in order to gain market share in the PC space. 3. Steam is a monopoly. They fix prices for all games sold on PC, and they have a veto power in order to overrule anyone who wants to sell games for less than they deem as appropriate. Now first, let's discuss Valve's 30% cut and the claim that it is excessive and they could do the same with less. We're going to try to keep it short, brief, and to the point so that we can just get the facts out there and then make some conjectures based upon those facts. The first thing that you need to know is whenever you do in a corporate budget, you have two factors that roll into your budget. You have operational expenditures, or OPEX, and capital expenditures, CAPEX. Operational expenditures are your day-to-day -day fees and costs, such as employee wages and benefits, licensing fees, rent, power, that sort of thing. Capital expenditures are a little bit more complicated. Capital expenditures are very large purchases of something that carries inherent value over time. The prime example of this is usually real estate. If you spend a large chunk of money buying a piece of real estate, that is going to continue to carry value over a long period of time. Therefore, you have the ability when you're doing a budget to break up the initial purchase of that in your budget over a long period of time based upon usual standard estimates for budgeting on how that can be amortized. Amortization is the process of breaking that up through your budget. You're still cutting a check to whomever you're buying it from up front, but the actual cost incurred to your company is budgeted out over time. With software in particular, you have two factors that you'll often hear. You'll hear R&D thrown around a lot, right? It stands for research and development. Well, the research part of it is an operational expenditures that is written off at the end of the year on your final budget for that year. However, the development piece of that can actually be capitalized as a CapEx expense and then amortized over the lifespan of that software. In this case, probably about five years. Based upon market averages for a given company of Valve size, a multi-billion dollar company with at least few hundred or more employees, you'll usually see the operational expenditures take up about 30% of your annual budget. Average CapEx budget usually accounts for about 20% of your annual budget. 
Now, the last part that we have to go over is transactional fees. We have two pieces of transactional fees here that we have to discuss. The first is credit card transaction fees. Whenever you use your credit card to make a purchase, the seller that is selling you the product that you're buying with a credit card has to pay a bank a percentage of that sale. This varies between two and a half and three and a half percent of that sale. However, for the sake of this argument, we'll use the low number and say it's two and a half percent. Then we get into the other piece of this, which is Steam wallet cards or other non-credit card purchases. Recently, Valve actually made it publicly known that 87% of all of their transactions through the Steam store are not made with credit cards. Whenever you go and buy a Steam wallet card, say it's a $20 or a $50 Steam wallet card, you see it says $20. You go up to the register, you pay $20, and you get $20. But those cards cost money to print, there are fees that the store takes off the top as well for stocking and their own personnel costs. As a result, they lose about 15% off the top of every Steam Wallet card that's been activated. This is where I actually calculate, based upon the fact that there are other cash transitional purchases available outside the US, I average the Steam Wallet card costs to be about 7.5% between credit card fees at 2.5% and Steam wallet card fees at 7.5%, we'll round that to a nice even 10%. So you have 30% from your operational expenditures, 20% from your capital expenditures, and then 10% from your transactional costs. Overall, that's a 60% overhead. To be clear, as we get into the math on here, Valve's revenue is calculated on 30% of a game sold on the Steam store. There's two things to count on here. The 70% does not count as Steam's revenue. That is the publisher's revenue. You and someone else can't say that you made the same revenue for the same things. That is tax fraud. Finally, as we wrap this up, Let's talk about Steam Keys. Based upon an Ars Technica article, they found that about one third of all of the activations that happen on Steam are through Steam Keys, which are activation keys generated by the publisher that are able to be activated directly on Steam without Steam taking their cut. The reason why I'm accounting for Steam Keys into this overall figure here is because in order for a publisher to generate Steam keys to activate a game on Steam, it has to also be sold on Steam. With that in mind, being that one third of games activated on Steam are Steam keys, that means that 66% of that 30% is actually actionable revenue by Valve. That translates to instead of a 30% cut, they have a 19.8% cut. When we do the math on that 60% overhead on top of a 19.8% real revenue off of a game sold, we end up with 7.92% real profit per a game activated on Steam. Let's move on to our next point here. Let's discuss the claim that exclusivity is competition and it's necessary for Epic to gain a foothold in the PC marketplace. I'm not going to deny that there isn't a certain concept of competition by way of proxy through exclusivity. However, exclusivity itself is actually the nature of excluding a competitor, hence the name exclusivity, excluding a competitor from being able to access a good, a service, or a distribution method. By definition, exclusivity is not competition. But let's dive a little deeper into that. Not just the definitional meaning. What are the potential downsides of exclusivity? Well, the first one is pretty easy to show. Exclusivity oftentimes will cause the platform on which an exclusive product is available to stagnate 
and to no longer innovate. Exclusivity often carries higher prices to it. Epic themselves have been spending millions of dollars to buy these companies into exclusivity contracts because they essentially have to compensate them for the revenue loss by not being on Steam. The reason why is multifold. That's upfront. That's not accounting for them also making 18% less per game sold on Epic. Furthermore, when you have that higher cost and you are focused on exclusive content as opposed to your platform, you tend to spend less money overall in your budget building up your platform and more money gaining, acquiring, and keeping exclusive content. My prime example of this currently that you can see right now is your major video streaming platforms such as Netflix, Hulu, Amazon Prime, and so on. There is not a huge amount of differentiation between them. The experience is largely the same. The reason why is because most of them are focused on just acquiring exclusive content and using that as the means by which to sell their service. The content is what is competing. Do you like the exclusives better on this platform or the exclusives better on this platform? Oh, you like this one better? Well, you're going to choose that one. It is competition by proxy. The actual platform itself is not competing. This is one of the reasons why exclusives has been seen as not really a good thing for a market long term. Short term, however, it does have benefits for particularly the publisher. The publisher themselves do make extended profits because they can oftentimes demand higher prices from the distributor. Case in point of this was AT&T's exclusivity deal with the iPhone. Apple was able to charge a higher premium to AT&T in order to keep the iPhone exclusive to AT&T for longer. The more popular the iPhone got, the higher the fees got for keeping that phone exclusive until AT&T could no longer keep it up, and then all of a sudden the iPhone is now available on all carriers. Again, we do see some gems of innovation occasionally here. For example, the rental video streaming platform Google Play does have some unique pause features whenever you pause a movie and it highlights the actors that are on screen and gives you a description of who they are and maybe a short IMDb clip if you want. But the Google Play video streaming platform doesn't have exclusivity. It's a movie rental service, so it has all of the movies that you want available on it. Nothing's exclusive. Next, we tackle the issue of piracy. What there is a direct correlation to is the amount of exclusive content and the rate of piracy. The more the content is exclusive and the less it's accessible to a wide audience, the higher the piracy rate becomes. This dates back to the early 2000s whenever you had multiple different services where you could buy digital music from, but they were all isolated from each other and none of them were interoperable with each other. As a result, you saw piracy go through the roof with the rise of platforms like Napster or LimeWire. Then, once you had a service that made music accessible again, Spotify, all of a sudden, the piracy rates plummeted. Finally, we can tackle the easy to dismiss and low hanging fruit here. That Steam is a monopoly, that they fix prices, and that they have some kind of veto power to reject companies that wanna charge less for games. First, there is literally no evidence that Steam is a monopoly. There are two factors to judge if a company is a monopoly. Number one, if they attempt to control prices, and number two, if they attempt to exclude competition. The thing is, is in order for that price fixing accusation to be true, the price fixing that Steam would have to be doing is not the price of a video game. The price fixing they would be, have to be doing is the cost for distribution. The reason why this is a particular monopolistic behavior is because any other distribution platforms people competing with Steam would not be able to offer their services for cheaper in order to get a leg up or advantage. Furthermore, as a price fixing scheme, this comes into the second piece, excluding competition. If a monopolistic company that has significant enough power 
is able to prevent their competitors from doing business in the market, especially small entrance companies, then that would be seen as an antitrust violation and they would incur heavy fines. The key on here is that they have to prevent other companies from being able to do business on their level. What to look at from here is that Valve not only doesn't prevent their competitors from doing business, they actually allow them to do business more freely. They did not attempt to prevent EA or Activision Blizzard from taking their games to their own unique exclusive storefronts. They don't prevent GOG from selling DRM free games. They don't prevent itch.io from offering a customizable revenue share with the developer in itch.io themselves. There is no restriction on competition on the PC marketplace, which is primarily how Epic has been able to gain the traction that they've been able to do. However, there is a company that is currently trying to fix the prices of the distribution market at an 88-12 revenue split and is currently buying up exclusive content in order to exclude their competition. Any guesses on who that company is? If this is your first time tuning into one of my videos, hello. I hope to make some more content like this in the future, but deep dives like this do take a significant more amount of time for me to produce them. I currently run a gaming community of logical individuals who aren't about being a fanboy for a corporation or another. We just enjoy games and want those games to be the best they possibly can be. I also stream a bi-weekly podcast where myself and three other tech industry professionals will discuss gaming news and our thoughts on them based upon our technical expertise. With that said, I'm going to sign off. As I always say, be skeptical and question everything. I'll see you guys next time.